Supply chain at an organization the size of Unilever is complex and drives innovation for the whole company. We're speaking with Wendy Herrick, the head of digital supply chain at Unilever. Wendy, tell us about supply chain at Unilever. Our integrated and connected supply chain is at the heart of our ability to make more than 77,000 SKUs and win in more than 190 countries uh, across the globe. Um, you know, we capture uh, the consumer demand and we turn brilliant brand and product innovation into delivering high quality products to more than two and a half billion consumers every day. So 77,000 SKUs. Connect that huge number to supply chain. We have 220, and in fact, 221, I believe, owned factories, uh, and more than 3,300 discrete lines in which we run those products. But it's not just our own factories. Um, you know, we also have more than 900 partnerships with collaborative manufacturers as well. So it's a huge, huge job um, to deliver those uh, products to our consumer. Now, you're head of digital supply chain. It's, it's an interesting title and role. Tell us what that means and what it encompasses. When you say the word digital, people always jump to the conclusion that it's all about technology. Um, but we've actually defined the role quite differently. I mean, technology is just a piece of it, you know? My role is overarching to the supply chain transformation program. You know, our, our digital transformation is aimed at creating exponentially better customer and consumer experiences across our end-to-end -end value network. So my role specifically is all about the integration and connectedness of it, connectedness of processes, of innovation, right? Not just product innovation, right? But technology and partner innovation. And it's really all underpinned. The most important thing is future fit talent. Wendy, you mentioned the broader digital transformation at Unilever. So tell us about that to give us more context for understanding supply chain and the value network you were just talking about. So we went from knowing it all to learning it all. And that's one of our mantras. Uh, and we really needed to open our minds to what's possible and what's out there. So we talked to more, I think, than more than 100 different organizations, um, more than uh, 30 or 40 different industries. We really did a lot of outside in before we came to decide or define what our transformation was going to be about. And we defined it using what we call the three Ps. And what we mean by that is platforms. So those things that we're gonna continuously invest in, not only today, but into the future, because we see it's where we can win. Um, another P is around uh, people, you know, so that future fit talent that I talked to and making sure we're upskilling and we have the right talent and right organization and roles for the future, but also the right partners. You know, we can't do this on our own. So whatever innovation is out there, bringing those partners to the table and really making them an extension of our value network. I know you're working with ERA, and I'm grateful to ERA for making our conversation possible. Where does ERA fit into this? We have the same passion and vision. You know, we want to build the self-driving and uh, they call it enterprise. We call it a consumer value network, right? And in order to do that, you need cognitive technology. And with their uh, experience with Fred Schurich and Kushal um, and the team there, uh, they have a lot of experience, even in um, you know, other technologies. When you talk about cognitive technology and the work you're doing with ERA, can you give us some concrete examples to help us understand, sort of get under the surface a little bit of, of what that means and, and also why it's very important? When you start to look at your processes, Michael, uh, you, you sit there and look at those things which are non-value added, right? And, and you know, you, you, I think of it in terms of me, do I want to do that job any, every day? Or, you know, where can we automate, right? And you look across all your processes and you start to look at those areas where you can automate. But there's also um, predicting uh, what's going to happen and prescribing what you can do. So, you know, that human in the loop, is about making it visible. This is descriptive. This is what's going to happen. Well, Eric can do that. Then it's about predicting. It's about taking, saying, I think you're going to struggle to you know, provide that product to that customer, to customer A. 
So that's human on the loop. What do you do? You're predicting something's going to happen, and then you expect the 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 human in the loop to uh, on the loop to take action. And then there's that human out of the loop where, and this is where error comes into play. I would say they do along the whole spectrum, but this is where the intelligent write back. Um, you know, once you're saying, you know, the human's out of the loop, it's basically you're saying, look, for those decisions, just go, right? So imagine the speed uh, on which you can act. Imagine um, the jobs, that, you know, satisfaction you're creating for humans that actually now don't have to do that tedious work. Um, and, and, and also the opportunities um, that you're taking advantage of because you're predicting and prescribing what you actually need to do. Um, yeah, that, that pace of decision making, it just really requires a new way of working in this era, uh, in the era we're in the digital era. And that's where era um, has, has helped us. Does it require a leap of faith or trust that you're placing your supply chain, which is one of the crown jewels of Unilever, in the hands of a machine? When we embarked on machine learning and AI before, there's a number of arenas where it's a black box, right? So something comes out and they predict that this is going to happen, but you don't truly understand the black box and how it's thinking and what's been put in that black box to take those uh, to take that information to give you a prediction. With ERA, it's a clear box, right? So everything that's there, you can follow the logic, the algorithms are there, and you can actually then follow. So if the human is still in the loop, human or machine, you can follow the audit trail of the decisions that have been taken, all the actions that have been taken. And, you st and again, it's like treating this machine as part of your organization. It, it, they're part of your org chart, right? And, and it's really about um, being incredibly smart in where you do that um, and where you trust it and being, um, you know, for those more complex decisions. Wendy, you've been describing the digital transformation strategy. Now, what's the connection between that and what you're doing with supply chain? It's actually underpinned by three strategic focus areas. So one is about agility. Everyone's talking about agility today, especially during, uh, especially during COVID. You know, agility for the changing marketplace. Our consumers continuously, continuously change. You know, they say the rate of change will never be as slow as it is today. Um, so, so agility for a changing marketplace is one of those strategic areas. The other one is reshaping our costs and asset base. How do we get quicker on innovation? How do we make the most use and of, of our assets that currently are in the business? And then the third one is about caring for the people and planet. That caring for people and planet is front and center. Wendy, how much of this transformation involves technology and processes versus the culture change aspects? 75% of transformations fail because of culture. So we took that very, very, very seriously. Um, and, and we have, you know, and culture doesn't happen overnight. But if you look at some of the technology today, you can do that within three months, right? But if you look at culture, it takes a much longer time and a lot of effort and leadership in which to do that. Uh, so I would say that culture has been really, really critical, but, but also the processes in technology are all part of that journey as well. And what are the kinds of technologies that come into play? It's everything from digital twins uh, to AR and VR, uh, 3D printing, AI and machine learning, and the list kind of goes on and on. That, that's just to name a few. But there's a blockchain. You know, there's just a lot out there. And, and you really need to be, uh, I would say, very choiceful. Um, and how you do that. And of course, you have the technology for your, you know, your, your ERP system and your basic transactions. Um, but there's, there's an incredible, incredible amount of technology that's out there. You mentioned AI, machine learning. Where does that come into play with supply chain? Absolutely critical, right? So even if you look at the jobs of the future and what people want to be doing, they don't want to be working on spreadsheets and staring, doing the same job in uh, day in and day out every day. You know, we want to create the jobs of the future. Uh, we want to have the process of the future. So when you start to segment your your processes and your decisions, 
there's some decisions that a that a machine can take an off uh, an awful lot quicker than than a human and take in a lot more information. Uh, but then there's those decisions that really really require they're more complex um, and and really you need that human in the loop there. Um, human out of the loop, the, the human doesn't, you know, the machine can do just as good of a job, right? And then when it's in the loop, it's really where in, in between the two of them and, and how you basically segment your decisions in that sort of way. Wendy, the global pandemic has kind of wreaked havoc with supply chains. What has been the impact on Unilever and how have you dealt with it? You know, Alan Jope, our CEO, and the board really, really stepped up very, very fast and, and, and focused us as an organization, supply chain or whatever function that you're in, on five key areas. First and foremost was our people, keeping our people safe. The second thing to focus on was about supply. We make products that are critical to cleanliness, you know, feeding people, you know, our, the consumer needs our products. So making sure that we could supply those products and get them to the marketplaces where they, they buy them was absolutely critical. That was number two. The third thing was about staying close to the demand. If you looked at where demand shifted to, I mean, everyone talks about e-com. Of course, it shifted to e-com. It was exploding. No matter where you went, it was e-com. But we also saw other consumer shifts. You know, there was more you know, could you buy toilet paper, paper towels during the pandemic? You know, people were, um, you know, kind of big basket shopping and going twice, you know, once every two weeks versus going three times a week, that sort of thing. So we were looking at shopping habits, but we also looked at cocooning, right? So people started to cook at home, but then you saw a real uptick in, in other parts of our food business, in, in our beauty and personal care, you know, Dove and the soap and everything we did there. And actually, in six weeks, we started making hand sanitizer like you would not believe, right, to really, really help um, across that demand and keeping our ear to the ground there. We went to cycles that were unbelievably fast, right? So when you sit there and say, well, we have a four-week SNOP cycle, we went to days, right, and in some instances in hours, uh, we went to SNOP light where we could really do it at speed. And we, we we went from really what I call batch sort of planning to concurrent planning. And then it was all about giving back in the communities in which we live and work, right? So um, donations, um, working with our partners to make ventilators at breakneck speed to help frontline workers. Um, I could go on and on in that space, but really, really supporting the communities in which we live and work was very, very important to us. Wendy, as we finish up, I'd like to ask you to share advice for business leaders who are listening. How can business leaders overcome the challenges and the complexity of undertaking this kind of supply chain transformation that you've been describing? I think it's really important to focus on the problems you're trying to solve. I think it's really important to the, put the consumer at the center of your processes and what you're trying to do and to deliver. But I also believe that, you know, everyone talks about transformation. And of course, we've been on that journey as well. But we're never going to go back to not transforming. So, so really, we're starting to think about this isn't about a one and done. It's not about a start and an end. And we've transformed now. It's about what we like to call serial innovation. And innovation, not just in the product sense, which is always, always how we've referred to it in the past, but it's about serial innovation to make sure that you, can, you continue to win in the marketplace um, and I would say make sustainable living commonplace. Okay. Wendy Herrick, head of digital supply chain at Unilever. Thank you for taking time to speak with us today. Michael, it was a pleasure. Really, really enjoyed talking to you today. Thank you very much.